قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this live episode of Ask Zad As usual we will take three questions from the emails inshallah and afterwards you can call if you wish you will find the numbers displayed at the bottom of your screens and you can also call through uh, Skype at Zad TV The first question from the emails is from Sonia and she says is it compulsory that the Quran surahs have to be recited in order during Salat? We know that the Quran is compiled of 114 chapters or what we call surah and these chapters are in order beginning from chapter 1 Surah Al-Fatiha ending with, surah, with uh, chapter 114, Surah An-Nas. Now the question is, can we replace the order during Salat, meaning in the first rak'ah, I'd recite Surah 50, and in the second rak'ah, I recite Surah 49, or 30, or whatever, something that is before it. This is an issue of dispute among scholars. And this is known as a ten keys meaning something that is upright and you turn it up, uh, uh, upside down. This is called tenkis, or to go backwards. And the most authentic opinion is that tenkis in a particular word is prohibited and can be counted as an act of blasphemy, of kufr. So rab, you reverse it and say bar. The meaning is different. And there's nothing to call for that except to mock and ridicule the verses of Allah. There is a different difference in, in the ayah itself. Tenkis in the same ayah. So instead of saying Rabbin Nas, you say An Nas Rabb. You have tenkis in different verses. So verse number three before verse number two. So you reverse it. And also this is prohibited, this is mocking with Allah's words and verses that were revealed as taught to us by the Prophet ﷺ. When it comes to surahs, it's an issue of dispute and the most authentic opinion is that it is not tawqifiya. It was not instructed to us by the Prophet ﷺ to put Surah Al-Fatiha, then Al-Baqarah, then Al-Imran, then Al-Nisa, then Al-Ma'idah, then Al-Na'am, etc. This was not directed to us by the Prophet ﷺ. And this was the doing of the companions and they thought that, oh, this one is appropriate to be put after this one. And the evidence and the clear evidence is the hadith of uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, may Allah be pleased with the man with his father, when he prayed and offered night prayer once with the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet recited in the first rak'ah, Surah Al-Baqarah, then Surah Al-Nisa, then Surah Ali Imran. And we know that it is in order, number two, Baqarah, number three, Al Imran, number th uh, uh, four, you get Surah Al-Nisa. So this indicates that if it were to be an instruction from the Prophet ﷺ, it would have been written like that in the Quran, but it wasn't. So it is the doing of the Sahaba. And likewise, the Prophet ﷺ himself Sometimes recited in the first rak'ah with Surah Wallayli Ida Yagsha and in the second rak'ah was Shamsi wa Duhaha. And the order is different in the Quran, and there are so many uh, answers to that, and Allah knows best. Rishika says, Though I want to forgive some people, but I have a hard time doing that. Always I get reminded of what they told about me. How do I restrain myself from such thoughts? This is 
a classical case of shaitan's whispering. And why do we get these whispers? Because this is our test from Allah. I always repeat and say this. Everybody has their own test catered for them. So some people get tests by abusive people saying things about them and it haunts them to the rest of their lives. Others get tested with illnesses, uh, um, a heart attack, a stroke, um, cancer, etc. And they have to live with that till the rest of their lives. Others are tested in their security. Others are tested in their family, in their loved ones. Others, and this is the most severe test, are tested in their own religion, whether they remain steadfast or not. So this is what Allah is testing you by. So it's up to you whether to embrace it, accept it, and live with it, or that you live in pain and agony and the desire to avenge yourself and to get even, filling your heart with things that corrupts it and kills it, such as envy, um, uh, hatred, enmity. Always remember, treat people as you wish Allah to treat you. You forgive them, Allah will forgive you. And this is a fact. Don't worry about what people say. Don't worry about how bad you feel inside. Sometimes you get these uh, um, imbeciles, ignorant people who come to you and say, don't hold back. Express yourself. Let your anger uh, uh, show. Move on with it. No, this is wrong. You have to oppress, suppress your anger your feeling of hatred and enmity. Have a clean heart to everybody. You live longer, you live better, and Allah would forgive your sins for that. And the final and third question is from Mona. She says, is it permissible to become a fashion designer? Now, Mona, or Muna, a fashion designer like every other occupation, it has a job description. So an electrician has, has a job description, an engineer, a doctor, a, uh, an HR manager. Everybody has a job description. From your job description, you can tell whether my income is halal or haram. Is it permissible to become this uh, um, uh, job title or not? For example, someone who says that I'm a banker, my job description states that I have to open bank accounts and I have to facilitate giving interest-based loans. I have to call people to pay it back. I have to invest money, uh, long-term and short-term uh, investments that generates money through haram means. Definitely your job is haram. So Mona as a job, description of a fashion designer. What is your job? My job is to design dresses. That's good. No problem in that. Women should wear dresses in front of their husbands, fathers, mahrams, other women. They need to wear clothes. So if this is your job to design something that is to be used in halal, generally speaking, there is no problem in that. But if your job description involves designing something that is totally haram, so bathing suits, for example, nobody doubts that this is haram, clothes that reveal the awrah and they are to be worn in public, this is haram. But if it's something that is to be like lingeries, to be worn in front of a husband, there's no problem in designing that. You see, a fashion designer is not something that a woman does and designs clothes and dresses and that's it. It involves usually a catwalk or a fashion um, display or whatever they call it. And this involves them putting 
models and walking and, and, and catwalks and uh, down the runway or whatever they call it. And all of this is haram. So if your job description involves such things, definitely this is not permissible for you. Otherwise, if there is nothing haram involved, then inshallah it is permissible. Ayman from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. How are you, Sheikh? I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Sheikh, I had three questions. Yes, sir. Uh, first question was that uh, when does the fear of jinn, you know, constitute shirk? And, you when? know, can a normal Muslim... When does what? When does the fear of jinn constitute shirk? Okay. And, you know, can a normal Muslim who prays and fasts uh, ever unintentionally or, you know, unknowingly get scared from jinn in okay. a way that would be fear that would constitute shirk? Okay. Second question. And my second second question is somewhat related. It's that what should a person do if he is, you know, confused if in an incident for like 10 minutes he got scared by jinn, uh, scared of the jinn by, you know, thinking that if such and such a disease is caused by them and if that fear constituted shirk or not. Now, should that person, should he recall how he was feeling at that time, what he was thinking at that time, etc.? Or, you know, should he repent, you know, just in case? Third or question. Or should he first be certain? Third question. Oh, should, should he first be certain and then only repent? Okay, and the third question is that, you know, if he feels like he should repent uh, just in case, and that maybe by mistake he may have gotten scared in a way that would constitute shirk, you know, because Allah does not forgive shirk without repentance. So what is a way to repent from something that you are doubtful, you know, you okay. ever committed or not? Like in this case. I will answer it. will a repentance in which he is doubtful be accepted? Inshallah. Suhail from Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Hassan from Medan. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Aba khabar. Sheikh Hassan, I have uh, two questions. Yes. Yeah. My first question is, I looked into some videos of yours, old ones, describing the lehya, the beard. And I am wondering, uh, okay, the parts that I can cut of my beard are the ones that go above my, my cheekbones and on my neck. What about my lower lip? Just the one that is below my lip. Okay. Okay. And my second question is, uh, okay, uh, let's suppose I have some debt with my friends and sometimes I pay them. Let's say we go to a restaurant, they pay for me, so after a while I pay them. But then some debt, I forget about them. Really small debt, like two or three reals, for example. And if I forget about these debts, will I be held accountable in the Day of Judgment? Because uh, I, I, I heard that in the Day of Judgment, even a Shaheed will not have his debt paid. So can you throw some light in there, Shaykh? I will, inshallah. Uh, and if you will, from one from more the, question. Yes? Yeah. My last question is, uh, okay, for non-Arab speakers, I'm a non-Arab speaker, so... Uh, what are really good tips that I can get Arabic vocabulary? Is it from the Quran? Is it from watching videos and with subtitles? Just, just that, Chef. Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Amatullah from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Chef, please, I have uh, one question. Yes. Yeah. Um, the morning at call that you do after Fajr and after Maghrib, um, I know I was reading one of the books, the Zakulari title for referring us to the, uh, one of the English books. It says that every uh, when you finish Fajr Salah, you should say uh, Allahumma Jalimina uh, seven times before you speak to anybody. I mean, I don't know any part of the, uh, the morning at Kanda, but when I read the, one of the books, that's what it says. I said, let me ask you. It says you say uh, after Fajr before speaking to anybody and after Mar Maghrib before speaking to anybody. You have to say that. That's okay. my question. That's. Um, so, so you're asking about Allahumma ajirni min an-nar seven times? Yeah, it's fair to say after Fajr before speaking to anyone. Okay, I'll, I'll answer you, inshallah. All right. Wa Faizan from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. Jazakallah khair for asking. What can I do for you? Sheikh, I have like three questions. Okay. My first question is, you, you know that some people, uh, instead of saying assalamu alaikum, they say assalamu alaikum. 
they replace the ain with the hamza okay so uh, i know a person he started pronouncing it with ain so uh, whenever he calls his father most of the time his father makes fun of him for that okay because it's not normal in the place to say it like in that way so his so that person thinks that he said it in the correct way but his father like mocks him okay so um uh, today when his father was mocking him he said to his father this is the correct way that's why i'm saying it like this so his father stopped mocking him what's the question so uh, my question is that he didn't is is that considered to be mocking islam and if that is considered to be mocking islam is that person who his father whom his father was mocking okay. is he considered to be a kafir because uh, he got, didn't got denounce it the got your question second question my second question is um sheikh whenever i wake up after sleeping uh i get very confused if i need a ghusl or not from like a week it's happening that whenever i sleep i think i need a ghusl and that's like i get very confused okay i don't know uh, whether, whether that smell and stain is of uh, many or it's something other okay third question my third question is um do we need to do a complete wudu in ghusl and if the person didn't do the complete wudu is our previous ghusl accepted okay i will answer inshallah uh okay i think we have enough questions ayman from india says the, his three questions are all related to confusing whether the fear of jinn is something that constitutes shirk or not this is a very vague issue because it depends entirely on how you feel if i'm sitting on in a room and i have this fear of jinn that either pushes me to call them to seek refuge in them to offer sacrifice for them to avoid things that may alarm them as many people say tomorrow i have a an interview knock on wood way why are you knocking on wood so that the jinn would not hear the jinn would not disturb this good thing that's happening to me this is shirk normal fear that is a human nature is not shirk so if i see a jinn in front of me standing in front of me would i be scared or not hell yes if i see a lion standing in front of me will i be scared of course would that be shirk no this is natural fear so natural fear is when you see a snake when there's fire when you fear drowning like me if you fear heights and you look down as whoa my knees are not working anymore some people are like am i committing shirk no but the real shirk is when you are in your room and you fear an individual and you fear someone who has no power over you yet you're still afraid and you do things in their absence when they're not watching just to avoid what may happen if they were to be there and this is shirk so most likely all of what you have mentioned and the confusion some people say i'm afraid that the corona virus that covid 19 i thought that it was from the jinn or i thought that cancer was from jinn so what uh, isn't this shirk a shirk sheikh no it's not shirk it can be a cause we know that the plague as the prophet told us as salam is the pinching of our brethren from the jinn so it's caused by the jinn we know that and there is a big possibility that 
the jinn can also cause cancer. Maybe, maybe not. But it is not shirk to believe that because this is part of Allah's decree. There are means for things. So we believe that this can be one of the means if we don't have evidence that to back it up, the thought of it would not take you after the fold of Islam. So uh, all of these questions are related, Ayman. How to uh, uh, seek repentance from something that I've done by mistake? Okay, if it's done by mistake, there's no sin on you. And once you acknowledge and understand what I had said, then inshallah, you are safe. So hail from Malaysia. Malaysia says, the area, uh, the soul patch, they call it, I think, which, which is this area. I hope the director shows this a little bit in a close-up. This area, okay, so it's not a mustache and it's not a beard. It's the soul patch, which is under the lower lip. This is called al-afan naqah, and... The scholars have differed whether it is to be removed or not. Some say that this must not be removed. And some say it is prohibited to be removed. And I think Sheikh bin Baz and Ibn Jibreen, may Allah have mercy on them, their, their souls, say that this is totally prohibited to touch. And it takes the same ruling as the beard. Other scholars said that this is not the beard because the beard... As we know, it's the hair that grows on your sideburns and your uh, jo lower jaw and your cheek. This is the beard. Now, this is not the beard. And this is definitely the mustache. It's not your beard. And we can trim it. We can cut it. We can shave it. And this is what Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said in one of his Al-Liqa'at Al-Maftuha, or Liqa'at Al-Maftuh series. And he said that this is not from the beard. It's safe to keep it, but there's nothing wrong in shaving it or in cutting it if you wish. It's not prohibited. So this is something that can be trimmed. In a, if you don't have a need to trim it, then keep it as it is. But do not say that it is haram to uh, um, trim it or to move it, remove it, and Allah knows best. Um, so Hale's second question is, um, are debts that we are not aware of. Are we going to be held accountable on the day of the judgment? Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, رَبَّنَا لَا تُؤَخِذْنَا إِن نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَأْنَا Oh Allah, do not hold us accountable if we were to forget or to err, to make a mistake. So what you forget, Allah will not hold you accountable. Now, if the, per the other person is demanding his money, then he should have approached you. He should have taken a document to register it so that both of you won't forget. He should have had two witnesses to testify with him when he wants his money back. But if he didn't do any of the above, then, and you forgot genuinely, you would have paid him off. Inshallah, there's no sin on you. His third question is how to learn Arabic. I have no idea. Yani, <clears throat> there are so many means and ways to learn another language. And nowadays there are many companies that are providing online uh, and apps that would teach you different languages. And a lot of people are benefiting from it. I would uh, yani, think if I were to, for example, go and study Spanish, and I would love to study Spanish. If I go to Spain, for example, for six months, what I would do is avoid anything that has Arabic or English in it. I would buy the newspapers every day alongside with the newspaper I see online. I know that there is a peace treaty here and there. There is war here and there. There is a cyclone. There is an earthquake. There is a an airplane crash. So I relate the media news to each other. I understand it in English or in Arabic. I know what it is about. Then I read it in Spanish. And bit by bit, I will pick up the vocabulary as I go on. This is one of the ways of learning the language of a, uh, a different language.
by reading the newspapers, listening to the radio stations, watching something that in that language, providing you don't fall into watching movies or listening to music, which is haram, definitely. So for Muslims to learn Arabic, this is very easy because it's already in his system. He reads the Quran, he hears the Quran, he listens to a lot of lectures that involve and uh, include Arabic words, uh, whether it's by the hadith narrated or by the vocabulary used. And it would be extremely, inshallah, easy if he puts his mind into it and he makes dua that Allah makes it easy as well. And Allah Azza wa knows best. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as his soul and self. This comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the ummah of his virtues, no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. Among the benefits of this narration, it is important to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you, as well as supplicating for them, is part of having good manners. Reported by Al-Bukhari, reported by Al-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, Al-Bani ruled it authentic in his book Sahih Al-Jami', the explanation of As-Sindi on the book of Ibn Majah, and At-Taysir, Bisharh Al-Jami' as saghir Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have Mariam from the UK. Mariam? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu um, I read that there's a, uh, an opinion that there's a time of necessity for Isha. Is that true? Is, and, um, is what? I read an opinion that there's a time of necessity for Isha after midnight. Okay. Is that true? Okay. And. Um, I got another question. Yes. Um, some women um, constantly experience dryness during their menses. Does that mean they have to keep repeating ghusl even though they know it's going to start again? Okay. And can I ask one more? One last one. Um, what happens if you make a mispronunciation in prayer and then you realize after you finished but the time for prayer is up now? In what? In the, the hashud. In what? In, in Qur'at al-Qur'an, in the Fatiha, in Tasbih? In the Tahajjud. Yes, Tahajjud is the name of the prayer, but the mispronunciation, was it done in the Fatiha, in the Surah afterwards, in saying Subhan Rabbi al-Azim, 
in saying subhana rabbi al-a'la in tashahud? When you're sitting, yeah. Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Um, Ahmed from the UK. Sheikh Asim from Saudi Arabia. MashaAllah. How did you find out I'm from Saudi Arabia? Last time I said I guessed, but I knew. Ma MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Very high IQ. Yes, Akhi. Thank you, Akhi. Uh, I have uh, three questions I'd like to ask. Yes, sir. On, um, on one of your videos, I asked last time um, regarding the, if the Imam comes late, uh, while praying in congregation, do we pray alone or do we pray with the Imam? You answered uh, to pray with the Imam. But what if the Imam comes like 10 minutes before the, the next prayer time? You know what I mean? No. If he comes like 10 minutes before the, 10 minutes before the next prayer, do we wait for the Imam to come home or so, do we pray so, alone? So your question now is the time of Maghrib is 7 o'clock. The Iqama is usually given at 7.10. The Imam doesn't show up. We wait until 7.20, 7.30, and he doesn't show up. And there is like 10 minutes for Isha. Is this your question? Yeah, yeah. I like that, yeah. Okay. My uh, second question. Yep. Is, re is regarding, um, there's this shop um, called uh, Marks and Spences. And this shop, the founder is, um, is uh, a Zionist. So he supports Israeli uh, military, I think, and, and whatnot. But uh, this, this, the, the founder passed away, and uh, this Marks and Spencer shop, they keep um, like um, um, speaking out, saying that they don't support it anymore, they don't support Israel, they don't support any religious group. But because of its origin, are we allowed to buy products from this place? Okay, third question. Third question is, um, uh, there's this, uh, they, they call it a brand, the uh, Nike. This, the, the origin of this, um, bra uh, they call it a brand. Is, Nike. Uh, that it comes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I know. It comes from. I know. It comes from. It comes from a. Uh, um, a Greek um, goddess. I think. Yes, yes. I know. I know. I will answer you, inshallah. So we have Amatullah from the U.S. She says that <clears throat> she read somewhere or she heard that saying "Allahumma ajirni min nar seven times, which means "Oh Allah, uh, protect me from hellfire" seven times after Fajr, and after Maghrib. Before you utter a word, so assalamu alaikum wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, without speaking with others, if I manage to say this seven times, then Allah will protect me from hellfire and will admit me to paradise. So she says, is this authentic? The answer is no. This is not authentic at all. It was labeled as weak by Sheikh al-Albani. The authentic hadith is whoever seeks refuge in Allah three times from hellfire and asks Allah to be admitted into paradise three times, Allah would give him refuge from hellfire and will admit him to Jannah. And this is not related to any salat. And this has nothing to do with before speaking to anybody else. This is general dua. While I'm walking to my car, I say, Allahumma ajirni min nar Allahumma ajirni min nar Allahumma ajirni min nar That's it. Three times. But not to do it after prayers, because then it becomes a bid'ah. Ah. Faizan from India says, my friend, my brother, whatever, used to mistakenly say, like everyone else who is an Arab, they can't say the letter Ain. So they would say Asim. And some would call it awesome. It's the same. So if someone does not pronounce the Ain properly, when Giving the Islamic greeting, he would say, Assalamu alaikum. He cannot say, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum. So his friend or his brother or whatever managed or is trying to fix it. So whenever he used to call his father and he said, Assalamu alaikum, his father used to make fun of him. He said, Alaikum, alaikum, what is this? And he's wondering, is this kufr? Is him mocking the deen? And again, I tell my brothers and sisters, don't jump the gun. It is extremely dangerous to just want people to get out of the fold of Islam. Or to fear the jinn, then I'm out of the fold of Islam. To say a word accidentally, I'm out of the fold of Islam. This becomes an obsession. This becomes 
continuous whispering from shaitan messing up with your head and destroying your life and uh, 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 preventing you and depriving you from concentrating on useful things. Ask yourself, was the father, it has nothing to do with the son and the Holy Ghost, was the father of that person who said, Assalamu alaikum, mocking the Islamic greeting, or was he mocking the pronunciation? He was mocking the pronunciation without any doubt. He had no intention to mock a verse of the Quran or a ritual of Islam. So you have to distinguish between what was intended. For example, someone looks at me and he hates my guts. And there's so many out there that do hate my guts with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. I can blame them. So they say, well, look at the sheikh's beard. It's like a goat beard. It's so funny. It's not this, it's this. So they're making fun of my beard. So people jump the gun. These are kafir. These are infidels. They are making fun of the religion. Akhi, hold your horses. Are they making fun of this ritual? Of this sunnah of the Prophet, ﷺ, that he ordered us to do it? Or they're making fun of me as an individual. There's a big difference. If they're making fun of the beard because it is part of the religion, they are totally out of the fold of Islam. And there's nothing disputed in this. They're, they're making fun of a ritual of Islam. So those who write in newspapers and draw cartoons and make videos and maybe make stand-up comedies, like in the Arab world, when they make fun of this ritual of the Prophet ﷺ, because it is of the Prophet ﷺ, they're apostates. They're not Muslims anymore. But if they're making fun of me as an individual, as Asim, they hate my guts, and they had nothing intended towards the religion of Islam, this is sinful. But it, is, it doesn't take them out of the fold of Islam, and I hope this makes sense to you. Faizan's second question is that whenever he wakes up, he is confused whether he should perform ghusl due to nocturnal emission, or is this simply madhi? Akhi, the difference between madhi and semen, many, is huge. And anybody can know the difference. Madhi comes in drops. So like six, seven drops. And they are uh, uh, separated here and there. While many comes out in a gushing fashion. And it comes in quantities. The smell is different. different. The touch, once, once it's, it's dried, is different. It's solid, unlike madhi. And you can tell definitely that this uh, is a difference. Therefore, you have to distinguish first. And I have a clip on one of the previous answers I did on Ask Zad on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you just write in the search box the difference between many, medhi, and other discharges, you will find, inshallah, your answer there. The third question is, um, do we have to perform wudu when we perform ghusl, and what about what was in the past? This question we've answered so many times. Ghusl is a total bath. So a total bath is called ghusl. But this is divided into two types. One, a religious ghusl, a legislative ghusl, which is used to uplift a major impurity, such as a person in the state of major impurity, Janaba or a woman who is pure from her menses and she wants to uplift the major impurity. So this <clears throat> is done by performing ghusl. There is a sunnah way of doing it and there is a normal way which is just so totally soak your body, turn the water in your mouth and sniff and blow your nose with, mot with water. That's it. If you do either one, you are in the state of uh, purity, and you don't have to perform wudu. Because the bigger 
ritual, the major ritual impurity, underneath it, once uplifted, also uplifts the minor uh, ritual impurity. So two for the price of one. As for the second type of ghusl, or total bath, which I do maybe to go to Jum'ah or to the Eid. Maybe I do when coming back from the gym or when I'm hot and I just want to freshen up. This can never be used to pray afterwards because wudu was not performed. So there was no major ritual impurity uplifted and hence the minor ritual impurity was not uplifted and therefore you cannot pray uh, uh, with that. What had happened in the past, if it is a prayer or two, make them up now. If, it, if you're talking about years, then this is inshallah forgiven due to her ignorance and Allah knows best. Maryam from the UK, she says, I heard that, <clears throat> okay, before we take Maryam's question, we have uh, Radillah from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Ya Sheikh. Alaikum assalamu wa barakatuh. My question is, I pray you're doing well. My question is about Surah Ali Imran, verse 144. Allah the Almighty says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa ma Muhammadun illa rasul qad khalat min qablihi rusul. So question is, is Isa alayhi salam included? Jazakallah khair. Wa jazakum. Muhammadun illa rasul. Okay. Um, we have <clears throat> Athar from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Sanatullah. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Zakallah khair for asking. What can I do for you? Uh, uh, Sheikh, I have a question um, that uh, I was talking to somebody and they uh, presented a hadith uh, where it says that um, Jesus, peace be upon him, and uh, his uh, pious mother, they were never touched by Satan. Um, so in that, they say that only those two were never touched by Satan, but everybody else, everybody else has been. So does that also include the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or okay. uh, no? I will answer, inshallah. So um, Maryam's uh, first question <clears throat> was that she heard that Isha has a time of necessity. What is meant by time of necessity? See. Asr time is divided into a time of um, obligation and a time of necessity. So the beginning of the time of Asr is when the shade is equal to the height of an erect object. Once the shade becomes the same length, this is Asr time. And this beginning of the time is extended some say until it is twice the length, and the most authentic opinion is until the brightness of the sun becomes yellow, and it's possible to look close to it, which is approximately an hour and a half, maybe a little bit more, after the time of Asr. So this time, when the length of the shade is the same as the erect object, till the time where the sun's brightness is gone and the sun becomes yellow instead of white, this is called the time of obligation. This is the best time to pray. You're allowed to pray from the beginning to the end. But once the, the, the sun becomes yellow, till the time it sets, this is called time of necessity. So scholars say that, yeah, you can pray, but it is makruh because you've delayed it for too long. So the prayer is valid, you have no problem, but it is a time of necessity. This is what some scholars say about it. Now in Isha, we know that the beginning of time of Isha prayer is when you look at the west where the sun had set and the redness in the twilight disappears. This means that the time of Maghrib is over, now it's time for Isha. Till when? Well, the scholars say that it extends till midnight. And what, it's, what is midnight? Our midnight in Islam is different than the midnight of the Westerners, where Cinderella's cottage becomes a pumpkin. It's not 12 o'clock. Our midnight is calculated by 
measuring the time from the sunset till the break of dawn. So if it's 10 hours, divide them into two, it's five hours, add the five hours to the time of sunset. So if the sun sets at seven o'clock, then it becomes 12. If the sun sets at six o'clock, it becomes 11. It depends on these two variables, sunset and the break of dawn. Divide them into two, and this is <clears throat> the time of midnight. So she says some schools of thought, and this is true, say that there is a time of necessity, which is after the midnight till the break of dawn, this is time for necessity. If a woman, for example, sees her purity from menses at 2 a.m., we say that she doesn't have to pray Isha because the time is over with midnight. Other schools say, no, it is extended till Fajr. So it's an issue of dispute. I'm inclined to follow what uh, uh, the majority say that this ends at midnight and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Her second question is, a woman usually has her menses for six to seven days. Sometimes after the second day, she gets period of dryness, a period of dryness, but then she knows the blood is gonna flow back again. What should she do? The answer is nothing. If you know that your regular menses is between six to seven days, even if it stops for a whole day or less, and you know that it's still going to flow, then you have to refrain from praying and fasting because you know that your usual period is between six to seven days. But if this dryness comes on the sixth or on the seventh day, then this is a sign of your purity and Allah knows best. Her third question is that if she, while praying, notices that after she finished her prayer, she made a mistake in tashahud. She made a mistake in there. So she already finished prayer. What to do? If the mistake is in pronunciation and it doesn't change the meaning and it was accidental, your prayer is valid. But if you change the meaning or you've dropped a word here or there, in this case, that if the period after the prayer was over is long, then khalas, there's nothing to do. If it's a minute or so, prostrate for forgetfulness, Allah knows best. Ahmed from the UK's first question says, what about if the Imam is late for Salat? Well, this is according to the system of the congregation in the masjid. Usually if the Imam is late five minutes or 10 minutes for the Salah, immediately his substitute comes forward or the Mu'addin uh, uh, does uh, come forward. And this happened at the time of the Prophet والسلام, when the Prophet went somewhere and was late and Abu Bakr immediately went ahead and prayed. In another narration, another story, uh, it was Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas who led the prayer. So there's nothing wrong in that. Mark Spencer, Zionist Nike, a Greek goddess. What's your ruling on buying and using these uh, products? I see no problem in using them being Zionist or being Jew or being whatever, we can buy in and sell with them. The Muslims used to buy and sell with the fire worshipers, with the Byzantians, with the Christians, with the Jews. They had no problem in that. So we can't be more yeah, any, uh, uh, Christians than the Pope, as they say. So it's, it's totally permissible. As for Nike, it's a brand that nobody knows the origin of it. And if you go through Google, there are tens if not more of similar brands of Greek goddess or gods or whatever that people don't even know or had ever heard of and the name doesn't change the permissibility of using a product or not. So I believe that there's nothing wrong in that inshallah. Radiallah from Canada says, is Isa, peace be upon him, part of this ayah, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَدْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولُ The answer is yes. He came before the Prophet ﷺ and he shall descend at the end of time to kill the Dajjal, the Antichrist, but he will come as a follower of Prophet Muhammad and not as a messenger with a Sharia law and with a new revelation and with a new religion. And finally, Athar says, is the Prophet ﷺ among those who've been touched by the shaitan when they were given birth, the hadith, 
excludes only Isa and his mother. So in order to say, yeah, but there is the Prophet Muhammad as well, and maybe Ibrahim, and maybe Adam, and we can't say this. We just follow the hadith as it is, and this doesn't mean that there's anything missing or anything wrong or anything uh, defected with our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was the perfect man and the best of Allah's creation to ever walk the earth and Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet next time, same time inshallah. Next week, I'll leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين